Good afternoon and welcome everybody. Uh, we appreciate you all joining us today. Um, last I checked, we had about uh, close to 150 registered, signed up and registered. Uh, so that's a really great group. Uh, we'll, we'll see our first poll question response here soon. Uh, the results to that so we get a flavor for what kind of audience we have with us today. Uh, we're excited to share with you all the latest news about today's microsurfacing in Cape Seals. A, a lot has changed with these treatments over the last 10 years or so, and that's our primary goal is to, to share what's changed with you here today. Just a quick, uh, and, and there's our, our poll results right there. Let's take a quick look. It looks like we've got about 60% are agency folks about 20% uh, consulting engineer folks and 12% contractor supplier folks. So that's, that's a great mix. Thank you again, everybody for joining us today. So let's quickly review our game plan for the webinar this afternoon. Uh, the first thing I'd like to do is share with you the answers to these five basic questions about microsurfacing. Uh, I think our experience level with the treatment ranges from none at all to a lot, but I wanna make sure that we have the same basic information uh, for everybody, we cover it for everybody. Then we're gonna be joined by Indus Quality Control Manager, Matt Tito, and he's gonna be covering some of the important quality control considerations with the treatment, including some of the things we've done to improve the quality of Indus microsurfacing. Then we're gonna be joined by one of our clients. Uh, my colleague, Art Baker from Indus is going to be interviewing Carl Gagnon from the town of Bedford, Massachusetts to hear about Carl's experience using the micro and Cape Seal treatments. Then we're gonna talk about what we refer to as combination treatments. And those are treatments where the microsurfacing is used as the wearing course on other treatments. Then we're gonna take a deeper dive into Cape Seals, one of those combination treatments and answer those same five basic questions that we're gonna be looking at with microsurfacing. And then we'll finish up by answering your questions. So a lot to cover, so and we'll jump right in here. The problem that we're all working together to solve, regardless of whether we're an agency person, a consulting engineer, a contractor, you know, we're all in this together, is this problem with the bad roads. Um, you know, the American Society of Civil Engineers in their latest report card gave the roads in the U.S. a letter grade of a D. So as a transportation professional, that's kind of embarrassing to me. I, you know, I think we can do a lot better than that, and that should be all of our goals to, to raise that report card grade. What, one of the reasons that I think we got, we're in such awful trouble with our road conditions is that we've spent too much time doing what I'll call worse first pavement management, trying to fix all of our bad roads, not spending enough of our budgets on pavement preservation or preventive maintenance. And, and in answering the question, what is microsurfacing? I think probably the best response is it's a surface treatment intended to keep good roads in good condition. It is a preventive maintenance pavement preservation tool because what we've found, and we'll talk about it more later, is that by doing preventive maintenance for small amounts of money, we can save ourselves lots and lots of money instead of if we defer that maintenance and get into rehabilitation and reconstruction mode. So how do we go about making microsurfacing? There's, there's really only five components that go into the microsurfacing mix. And the vast majority of it is aggregate. Um, it's, a, it's a quality crushed aggregate uh, that, that uh, is about 92% of the overall mix is the stone. And then about 8% of the mix is the asphalt residue from the microsurfacing emulsion. Uh, microsurfacing emulsion is always polymer modified. And the water and field additive components here, they're just really for field workability purposes. So that's what microsurfacing is. And for every combination of aggregates and emulsion that we use, we have to get a mix design done. A couple of important things about the mix design, this, this is a copy of a typical mix design report, are the aggregate gradation. We've got to make sure it falls within certain um, sieve sizes. And then there's a whole battery of tests that are conducted on uh, the, the, the emulsion and the aggregate combined together to make sure that it's going to provide a durable and long lasting mix. And, 
and Matt Tito, our QC manager, will talk about more, more about that later. Microsurfacing is available with different rock gradations, uh, type two, type three. Type three is much coarser than type two, and type three is typically only used on high volume interstate highways. Uh, and, and microsurfacing was actually invented in Germany back in the 60s as a rut fill material on the Audubon to fill uh, wheel ruts. We have a special rut, rut filling box that allows us to go from high spot to high spot uh, up to an inch and a half deep in one pass with microsurfacing. And we can do that without obliterating either the center line, pavement markings, or the edge lines. But the vast majority of the microsurfacing we do in this area is type two microsurfacing. And we're generally doing two lifts. So if you look down there on the, on the road that says double lift under type two, we're usually applying in the 34 to 38 pounds per square yard range. And that totals about three eighths of an inch in total thickness. And here's a picture of our crew putting the second lift down on a two lift job. And you can see that the, the material is kind of a chocolatey milk brown as it comes out of the box and before the emulsion's cured. And then after the emulsion's cured, it turns more of a, a black color as you see on either side of the, the pave, paver there. So we've all heard this mantra, right? This is the mantra of a well-functioning pavement management program, right treatment, right road, right time. What are the right kinds of roads for microsurfacing? Candidate selection is very, very important. So starting with single lift microsurfacing, single lifts of micro are really only appropriate for really good condition roads, uh, very little cracking, very little ra uh, raveling, uh, no rutting. Typically those would be roads in a PCI range of 80 to 90. And this image from the beta group, pavement managers here in Massachusetts, shows, uh, they call it RSR for road surface rating, uh, very comparable to PCI. Uh, a PCI of 85, this would be a perfect candidate for a single lift of microsurfacing. Here's one a little further down the curve, a PCI of 80, and with some crack sealing, we can see the transverse and longitudinal cracks here with some crack sealing. This would also be a good single lift micro candidate. Continuing down the deterioration curve, double lifts of micro are usually used in the PCI range of 65 to 80. So this road uh, we can see has a PCI of approximately 74. This would be a good double lift micro candidate. And here's one a little lower down the curve, a 70. Again, a, a good double micro candidate after these cracks have been sealed up. So where is microsurfacing appropriate? We, we looked at uh, the PCI uh, scores. We talked about those. We also want to make sure that the road is structurally adequate. And if, if we see signs of structural fatigue, such as alligator cracking or sub-base related rutting, then those are probably not good micro candidates. They're just structurally inadequate. And we'll often see micro used as a surface treatment alternative in lieu of chip seals especially in, in urban and suburban neighborhoods. And the same is true on higher speed, higher volume roads. Uh, we'll see microsurfacing as the preferred surface treatment in lieu of chip seals. Uh, the highest volume road that I think we've microsurfaced since I've been here uh, was this job here that we see in this picture. This is the Gold Star Memorial Bridge uh, down in the Groton, New London. Connecticut area. It's on Interstate 95. I think the one-way AADTs on this road are a little over 50,000 with a high percentage of trucks. We put microsurfacing on the bridge deck there back in 2015, and this picture was taken just a few days ago. So it's almost six years old. It's still performing well, protecting that bridge deck. So when do we do microsurfacing? We're seasonally pretty limited with a microsurfacing treatment. We're usually up and running in early May sometime, and we try to wrap up everything no later than the beginning of October. We find with all emulsion treatments, whether it's microsurfacing, chip seal, or whatever, you're much better off going earlier in the season than later, so you have some warmer weather to cure out the materials. Um, so we never want to push the envelope too late into October with micro, unless we have an unusually warm fall. Uh, temperatures are important. On, when we're paving, we want to have at least 45 degrees. 
And because of the water in the emulsion, we want to make sure that we don't have any freezing temperatures for at least the first 24 hours after material laydown. And of course, we're uh, rain sensitive. All emulsion-based treatments, if you've got a, a, a rain in the forecast, um, you might want to not pave that day, or certainly shut down operations within an hour or two before the rain hits so the material can set up. We, we talked briefly about the importance of candidate selection, absolutely critical, that whole right treatment, right road thing. But equally important, or maybe even more important, is preparation. If we want to get good long-term performance out of our micro, we've got to good, do good preparation in advance. Some of the preparation items that are typical on jobs, uh, we'll go out and uh, patch any potholes or mill out and patch alligated areas. And it's important to keep in mind that these repairs should be very minimal in terms of the percentage of area um, that they, they cover on a road. Otherwise, it's probably not a good micro candidate. If you've got lots of potholes or lots of alligatoring, uh, probably should be looking at an, uh, an alternative treatment. We also want to seal up any open cracks. Uh, there was a study that was done in the last year or so down at the National Center for Asphalt Testing in Auburn that concluded that crack sealing ahead of surface treatments like, like, like microsurfacing adds about two years of additional service life to the surface treatment. So that's a good bang for your buck. We always want to crack seal ahead of micro. Uh, if the existing pavement markings on the road are uh, thermoplastic or epoxy or even heavy built up layers of paint and beads, then we want to grind those off because the microsurfacing has a tendency not to adhere well to those materials. Then like all paving jobs, we want to make sure we do a good job of, of, of cleaning the pavement so that we can get a good bond of the new materials to the existing material. And something that's often uh, overlooked or not attended to as well as it should be is public notifications. Public notifications go way beyond putting up a few road work ahead signs. We see that the best of the best of the pavement managers we work with have a few different things in common, but one of the things that I've seen they have in common is they do a great job with public notices. And one of the reasons that's important is, is think about what we're doing. We're, we're doing preventive maintenance to keep good roads in good condition. So when the taxpayer, the uninformed resident sees you working on a good road, often they'll question, geez, why are we spending money on that road when the one around the corner is, is so much worse? You know, that's referred to as worst first pavement management. It's a loser's game. Anybody that's knowledgeable about pavement management knows that's the case, but we need to do a good job of informing the residents so that they don't think that we're um, not doing the right thing. So one of, the, one of the communities that we work with that does a super job on public notices is the town of Lexington. And I've got a, a link here at the bottom of this slide. And don't worry about writing it down. I think we're going to be sharing with you a copy of the slides after the webinar. But uh, what's at that link is a copy of the annual letter the folks in Lexington send out to their affected residents. And what's in that letter, it's a, a two-page letter, I believe, and attached to that is a map of all the streets they're gonna be worked on, including the specific treatment that each street is going to receive. And they talk about uh, what the treatment is, why the treatment's used, when the work's gonna be done, some basics about the work, so that when the crew shows up to do the microsurfacing, all those questions have been answered. And they built just a tremendous amount of stakeholder uh, taxpayer support for their pavement management program in Lexington by doing such, such a super job with their notices. So I highly recommend you check out what they're doing and try to mimic it in your community. So after the preparation's done, then it's, it's game day. It's time to go out and have fun paving. So Typically the first thing we're doing on paving day is we're masking off the utilities like this sewer manhole cover you see masked off here. I um, mean, one thing to notice is that we don't typically have to reset utilities on micro jobs. A double lift is only about three eighths of an inch thick. And what we'll do is we'll taper the edges of the material around the castings so that you don't feel them, that the traffic doesn't feel a perceptible bump when it uh, drives over the manhole cover or other utility casting. 
And sometimes we'll have to also uh, tack coat jobs as part of the preparation process, but not very often. Uh, tack coat is really only required for micro under two circumstances. One is, is if you have a, uh, a concrete pavement, and we don't have a lot of concrete pavements here in the Northeast. And the other situation is if the existing asphalt pavement is really, really dry, oxidized, kind of porous, then we will want to tack coat that. And the reason we want to tack coat that pavement is we want to avoid a drawdown or an absorption of the microsurfacing emulsion out of the micro mix and into the existing pavement which will help uh, hurt the long-term performance of the micro. So you can see in this picture, this road was pretty dried out and oxidized. We decided to do a light tack coat on this ahead of the micro. So while those things are going on out on the job and we're setting up traffic control, we have nearby a, what we call a staging area set up. And that's where we have stockpiled the aggregates for the job. And we have the uh, water and microsurfacing emulsion that it takes to make the mix. Um, stored. So the top photo, what you're seeing here is us re-screening the stockpiled aggregates into the body of one of what we call our support trucks. And then down in the bottom photo, what's going on there is we're filling up their cylindrical tanks on each side of those support trucks, one for water and one for emulsion. We're filling up uh, those tanks uh, and getting ready to go out to the job. So then the support trucks all loaded up, head out to the job. And you can see uh, in the right hand edge of this picture here, one of those support trucks connected to the continuous paver there. And they're actually feeding material, the aggregate, the water and the emulsion from that support truck into the paver, spreading the first pass on this two lift job. You can see in the, the lane on the other side of the road, that's been previously done and is cured out black. Uh, we try to only do one lift per day. That allows the bottom coat to cure well before we put the top coat on. Um, and daily production rates for suburban work, like we see here, usually in about the 30,000 square yard per day range, a single coat. And there's a, a close up photo here of the microsurfacing mix being discharged out of the paver down that chute into the spreader box and then being spread across the width of that box by the, the two augers you see in this picture. And then here is a crew again spreading the second coat on a job. And you can see again, the support truck is connected to the paver and then out ahead in the work pattern are two additional support trucks waiting their turn to uh, connect up and discharge into the paver. And then after the paving's complete, uh, we generally wait about a week or so. So the material's very well cured out before we apply the permanent pavement markings, depending on uh, temperature and, and humidity, that sort of thing. But about a week in most cases. So if we have a very, very busy location like this road here. We'd want to have some temporary markings um, to get us through that week before the permanent markings are applied. So we've, we've, we've looked at this before. This is the, the mantra of a well-functioning pavement management program, absolutely critical, but I think it's missing a couple of things. I think what it's missing are good specifications and a good contractor. So we certainly need the, to pick the right treatment for the right roads. But once we've done that, we gotta have good treatment specifications and a good contractor doing the work. And we, and like most construction jobs, it involves three inputs. You need the right materials, you need the right equipment, and you need the right people doing the work. As I mentioned earlier, we've made a lot of changes with our microsurfacing here at Indus over the last 10 years. And what we're seeing now is a much more durable and longer lasting mix that we're putting on the roads. And to share some of the changes that we've made, I'd like to now introduce our QC manager, Matt Tito. Matt? Good afternoon, thank you, Dan. Um, hope everyone's doing well. Um, so right materials. Uh, over the last few years, we've increased the amount of material we're putting on the road. So more and better materials, we should say. Uh, more mix in pounds per square yard. So we're putting uh, three, to four, three to four more pounds of product per square yard, uh, or about 16% more material on the roadway. Also over the last 10 years, we've gradually increased our emulsion content from 11 to 13%. Uh, 
Um, we've seen substantially better performance and longevity as a result of that. Uh, we're also using twice the polymer. Um, the new HIMA polymers that we've been using in, uh, in our microsurfacing mix, uh, it's offering a little bit more stability and some more elasticity. And the result has been an increase of lifespan of approximately two years on average. So our mixed designs are conducted by an AASHTO accredited independent laboratory um, that specializes in evaluating performance of microsurfacing mixes. So the mixed design is performed with every aggregate source that we use to ensure performance. And the process consists of wet cohesion, uh, wet track abrasion loss, mix time, wet stripping, a loaded wheel test, and a compatibility classification. Uh, so the photo on the left is the cohesion tester, which determines how quickly the mixture sets. Uh, or develops enough cohesion to be open to traffic. Um, and the photo on the right is the loaded wheel tester, which is used to determine the maximum asphalt content that we can use without the mix flushing. Uh, so both of our machines are outfitted with electronic monitoring systems. Uh, and that provides our op machine operators with real-time data on pounds per minute of rock, uh, percentage of emulsion, percent mineral filler, gallons per minute of water. Uh, most importantly, we can monitor our application rate in real time uh, in pounds per square yard. And the inspector on the project can also easily check these readouts at any time. Uh, that way he can confirm the mix composition and yield. So, but even the best uh, monitoring systems are, right, they're useless without a proper calibration. So before any product is produced, each machine that we have must be calibrated using the specific aggregate source uh, specified in the mix design. This ensures the mix produced will match the mix design. Um, you know, anything else that we would do is just guesswork. So the right calibration, the proper calibration is, uh, is critical and essential. Um, the photo on the right side of the screen is our truck scale that we installed at our facility in Braintree. And this allows us to do calibrations at any time. Ah, the right people. So in the pavement preservation industry, there's been a big push over the last four to five years to raise the bar for quality. Um, and that's by getting employees, inspectors, and contractors certified using a fairly rigorous education and testing program. Uh, Indus has been one of the leaders in that national effort. We believe that the certification of our crews ensures everyone on the project has a thorough understanding uh, of the steps required to produce and place a quality product. Um, it, Company certification is, is an even bigger step for us. So in order to become certified as a company, uh, we were required to develop and obviously follow a comprehensive 75 page quality control plan that addresses every aspect of our operation from mix design to calibrations, daily operation, uh, and even the training of our new crew members. So we're also required to provide annual continual, continuing education training for our crews to maintain our certification. Um, and that, uh, that QC plan and, and certification needs to be renewed annually. Um, and not only are we the first contractor to be certified, uh, to this date, we are the only certified contractor in the country. And uh, we take this very seriously from start to finish. Thank you, Matt. And, and really kudos to you and, and everybody on our micro crews for doing such a great job, stepping up, raising the bar for quality on behalf of our clients. We, we appreciate all that you do in that regard. Hey, Dan, one quick question. Yes, sir. A uh, question came over. How do you handle areas of raveling? Areas of raveling of what? That have raveled. The existing asphalt that's raveled, if you have some raveling. Well, it would depend on the degree of the raveling. I mean, that's one of the distresses that we're trying to cure with the microsurfacing. So without knowing, you know, seeing a picture of exactly how raveled it is, if it was really raveled, there'd be a few different things you could do. You'd certainly want to probably tack coat that or treat that with some kind of emulsion before. Or if, if it's a mix that's falling apart, I'd probably do a shallow mill of that isolated area and replace it with new mix, wouldn't you say? Yep. Sometimes a patch may be required. Yep. Okay. All right, let's uh, keep going and try to answer as many questions as we can at the end. Um, so maybe the most important question of all of, of the five that we're answering today is why should a community um, have microsurfacing in its pavement management toolbox? And I think there's been a lot of talk in the civil engineering community recently about sustainability. 
um, and, and specifically the triple bottom line of sustainability, which is these three benefits. And microsurfacing checks all three boxes in terms of this triple bottom line. And let's quickly review how it does that. In terms of societal benefits, I think one of the major societal benefits is the improved skid resistance. You can see the texture here in this close-up photo. We, we have a, an FAA-approved skid testing device that we purchased, oh, I guess about five years ago now for the airport work that we do. And we've taken that skid tester out on some micro jobs and measured numbers up into the 80s for skid, uh, for friction, and, and that's outstanding friction. So if you've got high accident locations, curves, microsurfacing is a very cost-effective solution for those. And really it just improves skid resistance on the whole road. Um, another big benefit is that minimal surface elevation change that we talked about earlier. Uh, being only three eighths of an inch thick in, in two lifts, um, we don't lose much curb reveal. We don't impact driveways a whole lot, guide rail heights, uh, utility castings, drainage patterns. So that's a big societal benefit. And because we can drive on it, typically in a half hour, uh, almost always in less than an hour for each lift. There's a very minimal uh, inconvenience to the motorists and we know how impatient motorists can be. So um, that's another big societal benefit. From an environmental standpoint, um, because we're using a thin lift, uh, we're, we're able to save some of our finite uh, quarry, stone quarry resources and petroleum resources that go into our asphaltic products. So that's a big plus. Um, and because we're reducing the amount of trucking and the amount of material heating, we have substantially less energy consumption associated with the microsurfacing treatment. And also many less greenhouse gas emissions. Um, there is a sustainability calculator on the roadresource.org website that we'll talk about in a little bit. And I did a quick calculation with that um, calculator there and determined that microsurfacing emits 92% less greenhouse gases than thin layers of hot mix. So that's a big, big reduction. But I think the benefits that, that most um, agency people I talk to are concerned with is the economic benefits. Nobody has enough money to do the job that they would like to do with their roads. So they're always trying to stretch their dollars as far as they can. And there's a bunch of different ways to, to look at economic benefits. One of the metrics I like for that is called equivalent annual cost or EAC for short. And what the EAC is, it's the unit cost per square yard of a treatment divided by the years of life extension that it provides. So it's sort of an apples to apples way to look at uh, how cost effective various treatments are. So this is a chart from that website, roadresource.org that I just mentioned. And you can see here that we can get more life extension from the microsurfacing when we apply it on better roads. So under that optimum performance uh, column where the PCIs are up in the 75 to 85 range, very common to get eight to 10 years of life. Most of the jobs we do, I think are probably in that middle column, a PCI range is 65 to 75, so six to eight years of service life. And what we don't wanna be doing is pulling the micro too far down the curve and using it where it's not appropriate, just because we'll get shorter service lives there. And when you think about uh, what you're buying when you're buying road treatments, you're, you're buying life extension, right? Um, it's all about putting more life back into your network. If you've got a, a hundred mile network of roads, then every year you use, you lose a hundred mile years of service life. That's called the remaining service life concept. Very important concept. You can learn more, learn more about it on our website or at roadresource.org. Uh, but that's what you're buying is you're buying life extension. And for microsurfacing, we, we typically see it arrive at the end of its service life when it starts wearing off the pavement and you start to see the old existing pavement show through. So this was a job that we did way back in 2005. I wasn't even with uh, it was Seal Coating Inc. back then. I wasn't even, even with the company back then, but I found this old photo somewhere in the archives. So 
uh, in 2014, I went up to the same bridge overpass and took a picture from the same spot. And that's the middle photo. And what you can see there is about, oh, probably 20, 25% of the surface area, the, uh, the, the heavy down pressure on the wing clouds that actually worn the micro off after the nine years. And then I went back three years later and it had worn off even more. So I think certainly the, the, the Commonwealth taxpayers, Massachusetts DOT, they didn't get nine years of service life out of the micro on that road, but they got a solid seven years of service life out of the micro. And in fact, they didn't do another paving treatment until I think it was 2019, but I'm not sure. So what's that? 14 years between the microsurfacing in 05, and then they did a milling and paving uh, in 19, I think it was. So let's just use for the purpose of this equivalent annual cost calculation, let's assume they got seven years of service life out of the micro. The project cost on that job was $3.10 in 2005. So applying inflation at just under 2.5% a year over that time period, it works out to $4.50 in today's dollars, divided by seven years is an EAC of 64 cents per square yard per year. So that kind of matches up with what we have over there on the left. Microsurfacing is generally in the range of 60 to 70 cents per square yard per year. And when you compare that to your typical hot mix asphalt mill and fill in the inch and a half to two inch thick range, usually those EACs are in the dollar to dollar 25 per square yard per year. So that works out to about a 40 to 45% savings. And there was an interesting report done by PennDOT a few years back that concluded the same results in that state. About, I think they came up with 40%, 44% lower EAC than um, mill and fill or thin hot mix overlays. So in addition to equivalent annual costs, I also like to look at life cycle costs, right? Uh, the roads are with us for a long, long time. We might spend a 30, 40 year career in this, this road maintenance business, but the roads are here uh, long after we all retire. So I like to always take the long view. And to do the long view, there's also a really a handy calculator on the roadresource.org website called the life cycle cost calculator. And we don't have time to get into it in much detail today, but I quickly put together this example where on the left uh, in the gray box labeled conventional plan, I looked at doing a thin mill and fill every 12 years, starting in year 12 out to year 48. Um, and then I compared that maintenance strategy with something a lot more preventive maintenance oriented where I started out doing crack sealing in year five, microsurfacing in year 10. And then that other that series of treatments you see in the blue box on the right, uh, more crack, crack seal interventions, a cape seal. And then at year 25, I um, did a minor mill and fill kind of clean up the surface and then started the sequence over again. So over a 50 year period or 42 years, I guess it was, you can see we had nine different interventions and look at the cost difference there down at the bottom. Um, total life cycle costs on the uh, mill and fill program of a little over 7 million. And in the uh, preventive maintenance program with crack seal micro and cape seals only a little over 5 million. So that works out to about a 25% uh, lower life cycle cost using a more optimized plan. You know, another way to look at it is, is this graph uh, over 50 years. And I took those preventive maintenance treatments, uh, the ones that we just reviewed in that last example, uh, they're listed down in the lower left-hand corner under preservation. So there were four crack seal interventions, two micro interventions, two cape seal interventions, and a mill and pave intervention at year 25. And those are depicted above by those blue dots in the, the series of, of blue sawtooth lines. I compared that to... Uh, doing unstabilized FDR with four inches of hot mix on top of it every 15 years. And we see that happening quite a bit actually in this, in this area. So look at the cost difference there. And, and I didn't apply any inflation or interest rate like the roadresource.org calculator does. I just added up today's cost for these treatments. Look at the big difference there. $41 for preservation versus 77 for FDR. So that's a 47% differential. We don't wanna just let roads fall apart and do FDR, pave them, and then 
let them fall apart again and, and do it over and over again. That's just way, way too costly. I think, you know, just like our homes, just like our cars, we're always doing preventive maintenance to those large capital investments that we've made. Uh, we need to do the same thing with our roads. It's, it's the fiscally responsible thing to do. So with that, I'd like to, to now introduce one of our clients, Carl Gagnon, who's the uh, operations manager up in Bedford. And he's gonna be joined by Art, Art Baker and Art's gonna be asking Carl some questions uh, about Bedford's experience using microsurfacing and cape seals. Gentlemen. Great, thanks, Dan. And thank you everyone for attending and taking time out of your busy schedules today to learn more about these treatments. Carl, why don't we start with um, just telling everybody a little bit about your preservation program and, and how specifically microsurfacing and cape seals fit into that program? Sure. Um, we found, you know, we've done, we're fortunate to be live next to a, a very progressive town. Lexington does a lot of preservation. Um, you know, we've done quite a bit of research and we found, you know, their program being so good and they were generous with their, uh, their time and their experiences. Um, we, we started, um, you know, interjecting uh, preservation in three years ago. And what we found is, you know, exactly that. It's allowed us to um, extend our, you know, our road dollars and, and, and spread them farther. I mean, uh, last year alone with uh, microsurfacing, we did approximately uh, five, a little over five miles of road. Um, and, uh, and again, we did that for a, a fairly, um, you know, reasonable amount of money and we, which left us a lot of uh, additional funds to, to address other areas. It, it's part of our total, um, you know, road um, management plan, um, which includes, you know, mill, you know, milling and paving, full depth reclamation, cape seals, uh, you know, microsurfacing. But, um, you know, in the three years we've used it, we found um, we've gotten great results. We've been able to touch a, a lot, um, you know, a lot uh, bigger area of um, our road network. Um, our complaints are down to nothing. Um, we had no complaints this year on any of our main roads for, um, you know, areas of blowout or, um, you know, where we have to address them on, you know, off shift or because of, a, you know, a, an emergency basis. Um, we had, you um, in the entire winter since uh, from December to now, we've uh, we've used approximately five ton of asphalt and patching all winter long. So, and, and it was a struggle to find a use for that. So our, our road network is uh, is in, in very good shape and, and microsurfacing pay, plays a big part of that. Great, how, how do you go about Carl, picking out which roads that you're gonna do on a regular basis, uh, on an annual basis, as far as uh, which ones you're gonna microsurface, which ones you might cape seal? Um, again, uh, you know, that was, um, that was a, a, certainly a challenge, a learning curve when we, you know, started to implement, um, you know, some of the preservation, uh, and that's important. Um, you definitely want to pick the right candidates, um, to get, you know, that, you know, six, seven, eight, nine year life out of, um, what you're, you know, what you're going to do with a, with a microsurface or a Cape Seal. Um, again, we've been fortunate to have, uh, our neighbor Lexington, um, you know, and we've kind of uh, talked with the engineer over there, John Liz, he's very good sharing information. So I, you know, between doing that, doing my own research, um, working with Alan, um, Vile from Indus, um, and coming out and, and helping me, um, you know, identify roads. Um, but you, you definitely have to look at, uh, candidates that, um, you know, they're, they're not past that point. They're not falling apart. You're, you're, you're taking a road that, you know, is still in, in reasonably decent shape. It, it might have some areas that, uh, you know, it's starting to deteriorate, some cracking, some minor rutting, uh, some raveling, um, and, and addressing those. And, and again, I think you just have to think differently. You're not, you know, repairing a road that's fallen apart. You're preserving a road. It's not, um, you know, microsurfacing isn't a structural improvement. It's a, it's a maintenance treatment. Sure, and and you know Dan mentioned uh, how microservicing can be used on high volume roads, low volume roads. What what type of roads are you using them on? Are you using more on your mains or more on your uh, low volume residential streets? For for us, uh, you know, again, I think they can be used anywhere. Um, for what what seemed to make sense for us, that the five miles of road we did last year were, were mainly all main roads or or feeder roads into neighborhoods. Um, again. Um, my approach is, you know, the roads that are higher volume, higher speed, those are the ones you definitely want to keep in, in good shape when people are traveling at 30, 40, 50 miles an hour. Uh, those are the roads that, you know, if they start to deteriorate, you're going to get calls on pretty quickly. So, um, you know, that's where we've concentrated our, our micropaving um, and cape seals are, are primarily roads like that. 
again, I think it could be used anywhere. For us, I think it makes sense to, to utilize the dollars on, on those types of roads and, and keep those in, uh, in, in really good condition. Sure. And, and Dan talked a little bit about prep work. Can you tell us a little bit about how uh, the town of Bedford, what kind of prep work you do there? Sure. Um, yeah. Any, any candidate that we identify, I, I actually, um, I, I walk the entire road myself. Um, and actually, I, I also, uh, again, Alan from Indus, you know, we, we identify all our structures. Uh, the nice thing about micropaving, you don't have to adjust structures if the thing is, is, is flush or, or, or thereabouts. Um, but what I like to do is, is I look at all my structures. If, um, if any are even questionable, I'd rather um, address them now. If I'm going to put any money into the road, I'd rather make sure that, you know, everything is in good shape, stable. Um, so, you know, I walk the road, I, I inspect every structure. We mark any that we're, we're going to, um, you know, adjust. Um, I have a, a contractor. We, uh, we come in and do a mill and fill. Like uh, uh, they were talking about, you know, if you have any deteriorated areas or, or areas that, you know, have some raveling, but it's not the entire road. It's an isolated area. We come in, we mill those areas out. We, you know, we pave them in um, and get those areas, you know, in, in good condition. Um, crack sealing is big, you know, they come in and, and we make sure we, we do, you know, a good crack sealing beforehand. Um, and um, then, you know, again, um, I think all those three things, once you have those three things in place, then you come in and do uh, micro and, and again, you have a good surface to work with and, um, you know, you seal that entire surface up and we found, um, you know, we're getting uh, good results. Great. And then let's end on Carl. You know, you've talked to me a lot about your uh, your payment management plan, and I think we all agree that's really the first step in a successful program. And I think you have a plan with Stantec. But can you talk to me about a little bit about how the PCI has changed uh, since you started implementing um, preservation into your plan? Absolutely. Um, since we since three years ago, you know, we, we do have a payment management company that comes in and does an evaluation. I think that that's great. It's it's a it's a great starting point. It's a tool we use. Um, but, uh, oh, you know, they, they do an evaluation of the town, um, a third of it every year. So in a three year time frame, we, they evaluate the whole town since we started in, including, um, Cape Seals microsurfacing, uh, last year, we haven't got the data this year from the five miles of road I did. And I'm really anxious to get that. But, uh, in, in the last, uh, last year alone, it went up, uh, it was either six or seven points, um, from the previous year, uh, after including some microsurfacing in, in Cape Seals. Uh, and that, um, you know, was, was, was pretty impressive. Uh, and again, uh, you know, we, we've gotten buy-in, you know, we're seeing results, we're getting buy-in from residents. Uh, and again, you had talked about education. I think that's huge. Um, explaining to, you know, residents, getting notifications out, explaining what the process is that, you know, we aren't rebuilding a road, we're preserving, you know, existing roads to keep those in, in good condition. Um, you know, I, I think getting buy-in from residents as well as, as town officials, that's another thing we've, uh, you know, we've worked on to make sure they have an understanding of what we're doing and, and uh, but we're getting the results. So that uh, bottom line, that's uh, the important thing. Great, Carl. Well, I tell you, I really appreciate your insight. Um, just valuable, valuable information. Uh, we're going to be putting up the results of the micro surfacing poll question. And we're also going to be um, asking uh, before Dan gets into Cape Seals, uh, we're going to be asking another question on Cape Seals. Thank you. Thanks, Carl. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you guys very much. Thank you, Carl. It's, it sounds like you're making tremendous <clears throat> progress in, in making network improvements up there. Those are very impressive PCI score improvements. So congratulations to you and your team up there. And, and thank you for taking the time to share your story with our webinar attendees today. Appreciate it a lot. Thank you. So we have some poll results up here. We asked the question earlier, has your community ever used microsurfacing in its pavement management program? We see that 50% have, that's excellent, 33% haven't. Um, hopefully they'll consider it after the webinar today and 17 are unsure. So thank you, Ryan, for sharing those poll results with us. On the few minutes that we have remaining here, I'd like to uh, uh, cover, get into what we call combination treatments, which I mentioned earlier, use microsurfacing as the wearing course in conjunction with other treatments. Uh, the first one we'll touch on is full depth reclamation with hot mix binder and micro on top of that. Most communities, I think, do two lifts of uh, hot mix on top of their FDR, usually 
two and a half inches of binder and an inch and a half of top. But we've seen some communities here in Eastern Mass do three inches of binder and then micro in lieu of the, the hot mix wearing course on top uh, to save a few dollars. I think most of you probably know that we started doing cold in place recycling back a few years ago, 2017 was our first year with that treatment. And we've done, gosh, I think probably about 50 jobs by now, cold in place recycling. The vast majority of those get an inch and a half uh, of hot mix for the wearing course. But we've had six or seven or maybe eight jobs where the, uh, the town chose to do microsurfacing. There were lower volume roads. Uh, we're typically recycling between three and five inches deep. So uh, maybe that, that uh, recycle layer provided adequate structure. We just need to seal up the recycled mix. So the town chose to save money and do the microsurfacing. We also covered lots and lots of hot in place recycling probably hundreds of thousands of square yards in the 10 years that I've been within this. Um, and again, that's a shallower treatment. They're typically recycling, oh, maybe an inch to an inch and a half thick, uh, a lesser distressed road than you would do cold and place recycling on. But if the road's structurally adequate, a lot of towns will choose to cover the recycled mix with micro instead of another layer of hot mix. And then a treatment that uh, I had never seen before until I came here to Massachusetts, that's hot mix leveling with micro on top. And, and what it consists of is a hot, sh hot, hot mix, uh, like a shim mix, that's uh, maybe an inch and a half, two inches thick at the crown, tapered down to almost nothing at the curbs or at the edge of the road, and then using micro to cover that and, and, and protect it. I think the community that first started doing that process was the town of Hingham here in Eastern Massachusetts. And they started in the late 90s. And one of the roads they did is this Winfield Road back in 1999. I was on Winfield Road yesterday and took this picture. And it's, it's amazing to me. That's almost 22 year old microsurfacing there. And it certainly needs to be crack sealed. We'll, we'll have to talk to our friends in Hingham about that. But, but how cool is that? So that hot mix leveling treatment uh, covered by microsurfacing 22 years later. But the combination treatment that we wanted to spend our last few minutes on talking about here in the webinar is Cape Seals. Kind of a funky name, huh? What, what's a Cape Seal? Well, the name originated, uh, the treatment originated in the Cape province of South Africa and thus the Cape Seal name. And it's a two-step process. The first step is a chip seal and then the chip seal is followed by microsurfacing. Oh, we've got another poll question that just popped up on my screen. If you guys could, could quickly answer that. We're, we're curious whether your community has done a Cape Seal or not. So if you could fill, complete, fill out that poll question, we'd appreciate it. So it's a two-step process. And one of the things that I really, really like about Cape Seals is that this this first phase chip seal is, is highly restorative. This, what we're looking at here is a close up of the distributor spray bar. And that's putting a layer of asphalt binder all across the existing pavement. So that creates an effect, a, a flexible stress absorbing interlayer between the existing pavement and the micro on top. And right behind the application of that liquid binder, is the uh, placement of these stones. It's about a single layer of usually three eighths inch nominal uh, diameter stone. And then about a week or so later after the chip seal emulsion has cured, we come in and put the micro down. Um, and this was a Cape seal we did in Foxborough back in I believe it was 2013. Um, if the chip seal phase is done with the asphalt rubber type of chip seal, then you wouldn't need that one week cure time. I think you could theoretically uh, do the micro the next day or a couple days later. But with emulsion based chip seals, we like to wait at least a week before we put the micro down. So where do we use the Cape seal treatment? Uh, you can see from our, our trusty curve here that it's a little further down the curve than either the standalone chip seals or microsurfacing by themselves. I think the sweet spot for Cape Seals is in the PCI 60 to 70 range. Uh, here's another image from the pavement managers at Beta with an RSR in the, the mid 60s. And you can see from the distresses on that road, a little too far down, gone for the double micro to be appropriate. So a really a perfect uh, Cape Seal candidate. 
as is this one. You know, once these uh, new cracks that is developed get crack sealed, put the chip seal on, add a layer of micro, and you're probably looking at uh, eight to 10 years of new service life for this pavement. Our, our seasonality and weather constraints are much like what we saw earlier for microsurfacing. We really one big difference and that's the, because we have a chip seal being used, we wanna get those done by early September. A good rule of thumb here in the Northeast is to wrap up all your chip seal work by Labor Day. So we could certainly complete the micro phase later in September, or even into early October, uh, but we wanna have the chip seal wrapped up by September. Uh, and the prep work is also much like the list that we looked at for micro. A couple of things slightly different, the crack sealing, because we're doing the chip seal um, and that covers the entire road with that liquid asphalt membrane. We don't need to worry so much about the smaller, smaller narrower hairline cracks that we would want to crack seal uh, if we were just doing micro, um, but we'll definitely do want to do the medium and larger size cracks on a Cape Seal job. And then the biggie, of course, is the public notifications that, as Carl alluded to earlier in his comments from, in, from Bedford, uh, you got to educate the public, let them know what's going on. And on Cape Seals, very, very important that they know that this chip seal, this coarse aggressive texture you see in the photo here, uh, that's not the finished product. Uh, the finished product will happen a week or two later when the microsurfacing is applied. Some important quality control issues that you'll want to pay attention to with chip seals. You want to make sure the stones are good, durable, uh, more cubical and particle shaped than flat, clean stone. I like to see it pre-coated whenever possible. Uh, you want to make sure the two key pieces of equipment on, a, on the job, the distributor and the chip spreader have been calibrated so you know exactly how much materials are going down. And we want to make sure the appropriation, uh, the appropriate application rates are being used. We're looking for about 65 to 70% embedment of the chip seal stone in the emulsion. So the emulsion rate will be based on the stone being used. Uh, for a three-eighths aggregate, it's generally about 35 hundredths to four-tenths of a gallon per square yard emulsion and about 20 to 25 pounds per square yard of, of aggregate. We want to get the aggregate right into the emulsion before it starts to cure, and then we want to set it with rollers, usually rubber-tired rollers. Again, before that emulsion breaks and cures, we want to get the stone in it and the stone set. And then after the curing I mentioned earlier, uh, we'll do a final sweep and apply either one or two lifts of microsurfacing depending on the rideability, uh, if there's any minor rotting, uh, how much traffic there is or the client's life extension expectations, either one or two lifts of microsurfacing to complete the process. So why are more and more communities adding Cape Seals to their pavement management toolbox? I think one of the primary reasons is everybody likes the restorative benefits of the chip seal, but they just can't, um, they can't deal with the public's complaints about the uh, coarse texture of the chip seal. So they like the smoother micro finish on top. I think the environmental benefits of Cape seals versus mill and fills are huge. I went to that sustainability calculator that's interactive on roadresource.org and I compared an inch and a half mill and fill up there on the left versus a Cape Seal over a 100,000 square yard project. You can see the savings for the Cape Seal was over a half a million dollars, but, we'll, but the greenhouse gas emissions were also reduced by 85%. So that's a big benefit of doing Cape Seals. And of course, it's uh, the, the lower long-term maintenance costs, as I just mentioned. Um, when you look at the equivalent annual cost metric that we talked about earlier, this is the, the equivalent annual cost calculator from roadresource.org. Um, you look at those two side by side and you can see that the Cape Seals end up being about 30% lower in terms of their equivalent annual cost than an inch and a half mill and fill. And they fall at about the same point on the deterioration curve. They're appropriate for candidates in the same general range on the curve. So before we get into your questions, uh, it's just about one o'clock now. I just would like to tell you this story real quick. Uh, this is a unique situation where two communities share road and the, and the double yellow center line is the boundary between the two communities. 
Um, the, 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 the communities collaborated on a two inch mill and fill back in 2004, curb to curb and split that project cost in half. Uh, then the community on the right, six years later in 2010 said, hey, it's time to do some preventive maintenance and pavement preservation. So they did crack sealing and micro for about, I think it was $4 and 50 cents a square yard at that time. Flash forward another eight years to 2018, the community decided to do crack sealing uh, seal up the cracks that are reflected through the microsurfacing. And the community on the left, it uh, looks like all they had done was patch potholes over those 14 years. So uh, I took this picture myself. It's a very busy road. We took this picture almost two years ago. And I don't think it can tell a story of pavement preservation or the benefits of microsurfacing any better than this picture here. For a total maintenance investment of $5 per square yard on the right, um, the town, the, that town still has a really good pavement, uh, really good ride quality, whereas the town on the left has a rough road and is staring at uh, a very expensive project to, to get that road to where it needs to be. So if we want to improve that ASCE letter grade of a, a D on our road conditions of this country, um, you know, that we need to be doing a lot more pavement preservation and, and micro is a great pavement preservation tool. So. We thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, we'll stick around as long as you have questions and answer as many of those as we can. Uh, thank you very much for coming.